Hey guys, and we're back for a lecture on sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. Sedimentary are my favorite because they have fossils in them, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, and then also metamorphics, which are also important, but don't have fossils in them, usually. Um, so anyway, um, I'm, I'm futzing around with microphones and stuff, and I'm still not really happy. Uh, so if you all have any recommendations for an inexpensive microphone, that would uh, make me sound a little bit less like a dork. I would appreciate it, although that's probably asking a bit much. But anyway, okay, so sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. Alrighty, so, so, um, so, uh, and come on, advance the slide. There we go. So remember that there's three kinds of rock igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Last time we talked about igneous. Uh, this time we'll be talking about sedimentary and metamorphic. So, um, so remember, igneous formed from molten rock. And then sedimentary uh, form in a couple of different ways. Uh, they can form either from sediment or from chemical precipitation. I think sediment we all get, right? I take some sand like on this beach in the upper right and then I cement that sand together to make oddly enough sandstone which you see on the lower left, right? That, that, that seems pretty straightforward. Chemical precipitation, though, might not, but it's particularly important for us in Florida because, you know, our whole state is made from chemical sedimentary rock, in, in particular limestone. And so what we got here is, you know, you got calcium. Let me get my little snazzy pointer thing going here. Uh, so, yeah, so you've got, you know, calcium and carbonate, which is a combination of carbon and oxygen, uh, floating around, dissolved in the water, and then some change in condition. In the case of limestone, it's really weird. You heat the water, uh, in this case, so you heat the water, and that calcium and carbon carbonate come together to make our friend limestone. Uh, lime, this is called a chemical sedimentary rock, right? Uh, limestone is not the only one. Uh, about 90% of the rock native to Florida, at least on the surface, um, is limestone. The other 10% is chirp, uh, where you have silicon and oxygen in the water. And, uh, and so that's going to precipitate out. The chemistry of that is a little bit more complicated, but it will. And you'll make a rock called chirp. Chirp is very, very common anywhere other than Florida, right? Uh, you find a rock in Florida, odds are it's limestone. If it's not limestone, it's probably chert. Uh, but other places, too, it's very common. Uh, silicon and oxygen are very, very common in the environment. And so this is a very common um, um, rock. People bring me rocks to identify, and they, they actually, after a while, get tired of me telling them, look, that's chert. Yeah, that's chert, too, and that's chert, too. Uh, the fun thing about chert, though, is it does have this conchoidal fracture. You know, which you remember we talked about with respect to um, quartz. We also talked about it with respect to obsidian. Chert has it too. Uh, this, this tendency to break in these round surfaces that make it so that you can make a sharp edge. And so, you know, it's a very uh, valuable rock for people wanting to make arrowheads and spear points and things like that. Um, and, and one of the field trips that I have planned for us to do, a virtual field trip, we'll look at another rock. Uh, the Hassan conchoidal fracture, and we'll actually visit all together online uh, a um, a quarry uh, for that rock. So that's not too far from where I am now. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, another chemical sedimentary rock is rock salt, uh, which is NaCl, which is the same chemical formula um, as halite, the mineral halite, but it doesn't have a crystal, so it's a rock, not a mineral. Uh, right? If this had a crystal it would be quartz. If this had a crystal, it would be calcite. Okay, so, so you know, these are all rocks that you know, would be minerals if only they had that internal crystal structure. So rock salt is literally salt, N-A-C-L. It's got some, got some impurities in it. Um, it's very soft. It's frequently, this frequently, not always, this kind of pinkish color. And yeah, if you were to lick it it would taste salty. Don't lick the rock. Okay, uh, leave that to the professionals. Okay, so <laughs> I'm like me. No, okay, so um, so these are all chemical sedimentary rocks, right? They form from chemicals precipitating out of seawater, change the chemistry one way or another, and get that to happen. Um, there's also, though, an important category that 
you know, really only has a couple rocks in it, and that is biochemical sedimentary rocks. Uh, these form directly from uh, biological remains, and, you know, there are a couple of limestones that we could probably call biochemical, uh, you know, these limestones that are just chock full of shells, um, but, you know, the, the, real, the real rock that we're talking about here, of course, is coal. Uh, you know, we've been talking about coal for a while now, but remember that coal forms directly from plant material, right? And that plant material, um, you know, happens in swamps. And this is what my my degrees are in. My master's and my PhD are all about coal. And so I will restrain myself. But, you know, as I said before, this is what happens when you have more plant material hitting the forest floor than you have decomposing. Why it's not decomposing is an interesting question that I will not go into, but it accumulates, it compacts, and it gets turned into coal, uh, which we then mine and burn, which we should not be doing. Coal is nasty stuff. We should not be burning that. Uh, beyond the, the carbon dioxide it releases, it releases all kinds of toxins into the air. Coal, just leave it in the ground as much as possible. But anyway, okay, so um, so now, so those are the chemical and biochemical. Now, um, you know, when I say sedimentary rock, really, odds are you guys think of a clastic sedimentary rock, right? And these form from sediment uh, being cemented together to make a rock. Uh, now, we name them according to the size of the sediment being cemented together, okay? And so, um, so um, you know, when, it, when a geologist says a word like pebble, sand, silt, clay, something like that, those are sizes. Those are size categories. And if we were in an actual geology class, we would look at the Wentworth grain size scale, which shows you the actual numerical size cutoffs for these things, right? But look, no, right? We don't need that, right? Y'all know how big a pebble is, right? You've seen pebbles, right? Uh, Y'all know how big sand is, right? So, so you know, in your, you know, intuitive idea about um, you know, the sizes of these particles will work just fine. That's just, that's not a problem, right? Pebble. So if I have a rock made out of pebble-sized particles, that is called a conglomerate, okay? Um, more specifically, if the pebbles are round, it's a conglomerate. If the pebbles are angled, it's a breccia. Uh, so, so yeah, now this is one of those times when I'm not really sure what the next slide is. So let's find out together. There's one in the field. Cool. Uh, and so you can see these sort of pebble-sized particles sticking out of it. Uh, the interesting thing about conglomerates is they have a very specific environment that they're deposited in. And this is the thing about sedimentary rocks I should have mentioned up front. Remember how when we did igneous rocks, I said, look, um, we don't really care that it's a granite. We care what that tells us right and we use the example of stone mountain and okay it's a granite it cooled underground it's above ground now that means erosion and this and that and you had a little story well the thing that we learn from sedimentary rocks is environment of deposition uh, different environments produce different sedimentary rocks right and so we already talked about coal forming in coal swamps, uh, you know, limestone forms in shallow marine environments like the Bahamas, uh, or if you were to flood Florida, that would be a shallow marine environment that produced a lot of limestone. Kind of same thing with chert, same thing with rock salt. So, so you know, so, so different sedimentary rocks form in different environments. And conglomerates are kind of interesting because conglomerates form usually, almost always, I'm going to show you an interesting exception, but almost always form in rivers, right? This is the East Fork of the Cherry River in um, in West Virginia, near a little town called Richwood. It's where my dad grew up, and I go back there every now and then for the geology. But so this is a river, right? If I was, to, I'm standing on a bridge looking at the river. If I was to go walk down here and look straight down and take a picture, you know, it looks like that. Uh, it, you know, uh, it's a bunch of rounded pebble sized particles that when they are cemented together would make a conglomerate, right? And so, you know, when we see conglomerates in the rock record, we really do almost immediately think river. This used to be a river. In fact, there are lenses 
of conglomerates in rocks that you know that at the time there was a river cutting down through this. Uh, and so it's, it's a pretty easy thing to recognize, really. Um, so here we are up in Canada. This is, you know, the overwhelming majority of conglomerates do come from rivers. But here's an interesting um, exception that's really easy to tell. Uh, and I'm, I'm including this because just literally two days ago, a friend of mine who... Um, who I have on Facebook, who I went to a school with at Florida State, he's now teaching up at uh, a school in Ohio, uh, posted this picture on Facebook. And I was like, Jim, that looks like a, you know, conglomerate formed by a glacier, uh, by, you know, by glaciers dropping rocks into a lake and forming a conglomerate. And he said, yeah, uh, I think it is. And the way you can tell that is look at it. Uh, you got a whole bunch of different kinds of rocks, right? Here's kind of a white-looking granite. Here's kind of a pinkish-looking granite, right? Here's a whole other thing. I don't even know what that is. Here's another, right? There's all of these different kinds of rocks. And the other thing is some of them are rounded, but some of them are angular, right? Some of them, you know, there's an angular one. There's a rounded one. Here's a kind of rounded one. There's a kind of angular one, right? There's a whole bunch of different shapes and a whole bunch of different rocks. That is what glacial sediments look like, right? This is a photo that I took just a couple um, a couple years ago up in Canada, uh, up there uh, visiting a glacier. And, you know, you can see lots of different kinds of rock and some of them kind of rounded and some of them kind of angular. And, you know, if you take all this and you put it together and make a conglomerate, you know, it's going to look like that. Notice that the river conglomerate, you know, if I turn that into a conglomerate, all those rocks are pretty dang rounded and they're all kind of the same, right? So most conglomerates are from rivers the overwhelming majority of them form in rivers but every now and then you'll get oh i went the wrong way didn't i every now and then you'll get an exception and when you do get an exception it jumps out at you it just oh no that that's that's a whole different thing but for our purposes conglomerates rivers really really rivers um here's a fun one uh this uh this is a conglomerate uh, here's a, a, another picture of it. This is a conglomerate on Mars, y'all. Uh, you know, if you look at it, you can see these kind of rounded pebbles. They're all kind of the same rounding. Uh, they're also all pretty much the same pebble. Um, yeah, that's a conglomerate on Mars. Uh, now, we don't call off the rules just because we're on Mars. If conglomerate forms in rivers, uh, then yeah, conglomerates form in rivers. And so this is yet another um, example of, you know, one of the lines of evidence that there used to be water on Mars. We have the kinds of rock that formed in water um, on Mars. Everywhere you look, we see rocks that formed in water. Uh, it, it, it really is fascinating. And by the way, some of you were asking me about the Mars 2020 rover and what its name was going to be. Uh, and they just picked one the other day. It's named Perseverance. So we can stop calling it Mars 2020 and start calling it Perseverance. Um, I have not heard anything about the launch schedule, which I assume means it's still on track. So anyway, so the Perseverance rover will be sending back even more awesome pictures like this. Um, so, okay, so um, if, um, if the rock is made of sand-sized particles, um, it is oddly enough a sandstone. Um, here's the thing about sandstones, though. Um, if you think about where in a modern environment you find sand that you could potentially turn into sandstone, right? There's a whole bunch of different environments, right? I mean, you know, deserts have sand in them. You know, beaches have sand in them. Rivers sometimes, depending on where you are in the river, have sand. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, I mean, sand is everywhere. Sand is everywhere. And so it's not, with sand, it's not quite as simple as, you know, well, sand forms in, uh, um, if you hand me a conglomerate, I'm going to tell you it formed in a river. Um, it just, it just did, uh, unless it's a glacial one, which it's not, okay? Um, <clears throat> if you hand me a sandstone, sorry guys, I need a sip of coffee. Mm. Much better. Um, if you hand me a sandstone, I'm going to have more questions for you. We're going to have to look at it under a microscope. I'm going to ask where did it come from, what was around it, 
etc etc to work out that particular environment of deposition um the one you're seeing here is called the wave it is a desert sandstone so um it is jurassic in age which puts it midway through um the time of the dinosaurs the mesozoic so it's oh let me see 245 it's a, let, let's say let's say um a couple hundred million years old and so um and so uh like i say jurassic in age uh and at that time this is in nevada nevada was a desert it was a desert back then it's a desert now and so uh and so yeah now in between it was other things right but but this is the kind of uh, uh deposit that you get in a desert you can see how some of this is really deposited at an angle that's called cross bedding and this particular cross bedding is a type that is very indicative of dunes right if i go back to my dune picture here and if i take a cross section down through these dunes and look at what the sand inside of the dune looks like uh it looks like that so it's a uh, um it's a uh, yeah it's a uh, it's it's a desert uh you cannot just drive up to this rock formation by the way it's kind of out in the middle of the desert you got to hike to it uh, and you got to get a permit and you got to enter a lottery to get a permit. Uh, they, they, they have more people wanting to hike to it than they, they want to let in. So, so you enter a lottery, you got about a 50% chance of getting picked. When you get picked, they make sure you have a map and water and you're not overly stupid. And then you go hiking through the desert to go the wave. It's really, really pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, so, so sandstone is made of, you know, of sand. Now I mentioned depositional environment. You remember, and, um, Here's our our picture of the Earth. Oh, I don't know, about uh, 70 or so million years ago, um, during you know during the Mesozoic, while there were dinosaurs, and um, you know I've showed you this before, but there was this this um, ocean going up through the center of North America, um, and you know a very very valid question is well, how do you know that, right? How do you know there used to be an ocean? Well, uh, you know there used to be an ocean because you know the rocks that we find that are that age are indicative of a shallow marine environment right i spent some time let's say right about here uh messing about um doing some things and uh you know the rocks there look like that uh these are you know inner bedded sandstones uh, different kinds of sandstone and some other things too, but this is very typical of a shallow marine environment, right? This is what this looks like, and this is the power of sedimentary rocks, if you will, because, you know, you can look at a rock and say, okay, this was a shallow marine environment, and I'm standing, you know, up here in Alberta, Canada, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of miles from the ocean. And so this is what sedimentary rocks let us do. They let us reconstruct ancient environments and talk about sea level, you know, and all, all kinds of things. Uh, and so it really is, really is fascinating. Um, if, we, um, if we go a little bit finer, uh, the next uh, finer grain size is silt. So, uh, right, I mean, look, you've all been to the beach, right? Y'all know how big silt is, okay? Or rather, sand is, right? Y'all, you know, you put your toes in the sand all the time. Silt's a little different. Uh, it's a little bit finer. Silt is about the consistency of baking flour. So if you're going to bake something, uh, you know, you've got that flour uh, that is silt size, right? And so uh, when it makes a rock, that rock is called silt stone. Um, and we can see some here um, in England uh, tilted at a, at, a, at a pretty severe angle there. Uh, but, you know, silt stone, silts or silt stones form in lakes. Uh, especially north temperate lakes, right? This is once again uh, from Canada, uh, and you can see you can see some small glaciers up here. But then my point here is this lake, and it has that spectacular blue color, and that really is its color. By the way, I, that's not been photoshopped or filtered or anything. That's just me taking a picture, uh, and that's what it looks like. But it has that spectacular, amazing blue color because of the silt settling out in it. Um, it really is, uh, you know, and every now and then in Florida, you'll get lakes like that too, especially in areas with a lot of limestone for the same reason, basically. Um, silt does a very interesting thing. Lakes and silts do a very interesting thing. Uh, they make something called a varve. Um, we can see some here uh and so you can see that you've got these alternating 
light and dark and light and dark layers. The fascinating thing here is one set of light and dark layers represents one year. Uh, and so there's not very often that there's a sediment that you can look at and go, that's a year worth of sediment. But in this case, you can. Um, and the reason you can is this. I know this is dry now. I mean, there's grass growing up there now. But this was an ancient lake. Like I said, this happens in north temperate regions. This, this is not happening in Lake Okeechobee right now. Okay, but, but you go up into New England, Europe places like that and this happens in the winter time in the fall and the winter you know you have a lot of leaves falling off of trees you have a lot of organic material washing into the lake and it'll make this darker layer then in the spring and summer you'll get mostly mineral matter washing into the lake so you get a lighter layer so darker lighter darker lighter etc etc as you work your way up now, uh, so each set represents a year, but one of the really fun things here is that an archaeologist uh, can tell you what year it is. Uh, they can date these things. Uh, and so this is really handy because there's a lot of VARs in Europe, a lot of VARs in Europe. And so, um, and so uh, you know, when they find an artifact in, you know, an ancient lake, they know how old it is because they know what var they pulled it out of. And you can track the spread of people through Europe. You can track Viking trade routes. You can track all kinds of things uh, by looking for artifacts in these vars. And they really, they really are very, very helpful. So um, if archaeologists love their silts and their vars, we paleontologists, we love our shales. Uh, shale is the next finest uh, particle. Um, you know, shale is, is made from clay. Sorry, the particle is clay. The rock is shale. Uh, you know, and, you know, normally I would hold up some clay in class, but I'm not in class. So, um, you know, there's, it's, it's funny because there's really nothing in your everyday life that is as fine as clay other than clay. Uh, you cannot grind something into clay and you, you just cannot grind something that fine uh, clay is so you have to chemically make it so so you chemically break down rock and you'll and you'll make clay um and so so yeah it is so fine in fact that uh it has a charge it has a negative charge on one side and a positive charge on another side which is why it sticks to itself and you and everything else. Um, if you've ever played around in clay, you know that once you get it in your clothes, you're never getting it out. It's just it's just it's not chemically bonded with your clothing because it is so fine. Um, it um, it uh, it preserves fossils, and you can see here here's a nice trilobite. That one is Elbraphia, uh, you know, preserved in that shale, and shale does do a very good job. Of preserving fossils because it is so fine and it protects them. Um, one shell in particular, the Burgess shale. Once again, we're back in Canada. Um, the Burgess shale. Uh, this is Mount Burgess uh, near the town of Field um, in Canada, uh, and and as um, Mount Burgess has the Burgess shale, uh, which if you hike up to it, uh, looks like that. Um, it is a World Heritage Site. Uh, you need to get a guide, and you need you can't just walk up there. You have to you have to make arrangements and stuff like that. And God help you if you get caught trying to smuggle a fossil out of there, because don't do that. Um, but the Burgess Shale is the site of some of the most amazing. Uh, fossils in North America, there's just an assortment of them. Um, you know, it has some things called trilo, you know, some trilobites, um, but then it has some really weird things like this thing here that's called hallucinogenia. We don't even know what hallucinogenia is other than hallucinogenia. Uh, it's not very big. That whole rock is only uh, a few inches across, let's say three inches across. Um, and with little spikes on its back and little feet down here that we assume it walked on. Um, weird things with rounded mouth parts and, and like grabby things sticking out of their heads. Um, this thing here 
Uh, it's called Opabinia, uh, and you can see there's a reconstructed one down there. Some really, really weird stuff. This, this is a, this is about 550 million years old. Uh, things that we had to make whole new categories uh, to put them in. So real, really, um, really, really strange stuff. Stuff that did not stick around long at all. A lot of it went extinct very, very quickly. But nevertheless, uh, so so kind of kind of weird. Um, uh, Steve Gould, um, paleontologist and biologist at Harvard University, he's passed away now, but but he wrote a really good book on the Burgess Shale um, called Wonderful Life, uh, the Burgess Shale and the History of Life on Earth or something like that. Really good book. I'll see if I have a link to it in the books I talk about module. Because we're sitting around. We can read a book. It could be fun. I don't know. But anyway, really interesting book. Um, so, yeah. So, so, anyway, so that's shale. And so, so, uh, so just to review very quickly, um, if it is made of um, pebble-sized particles, it is a conglomerate. Uh, a breccia, by the way, if those pebbles are kind of angular. And then sand makes sandstone. Uh, silt makes siltstone. Um, and clay uh, makes shale. And so, yeah, you know, each of those have a particular environment. Shales, by the way, tend to form in quiet, deep water environments. Uh, and so, yeah, so sedimentary rocks tell you environment of deposition, right? Different environments produce different uh, different sedimentary rocks. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at some place like this, like the Grand Canyon, and we'll talk more about this, but most of the rock in the Grand Canyon, at least the upper rocks in the Grand Canyon, are sedimentary. So this right here, that's metamorphic. That's the Vishnu schist. We'll talk about that in a minute. But all the rest of this is sedimentary, right? And so each of those different rock types here, here's the diagram. Each of those these different rock types, right? From the Tapita sandstone to the Kaibab limestone, those are different sedimentary rocks, which represent different environments at that one location there that is today the Grand Canyon. And so, you know, through the years, um, you know, sea level rises and falls and rises and falls and different things happen that will produce different um, different fossils, uh, as you can see on the right, but also different sedimentary rocks. And so that that's the real payoff of sedimentary rocks is what was this place millions of years ago when this rock formed? Was it a lake? Was it a river? Was it an ocean? Uh, if it was an ocean, how deep was the water? Uh, you know, there's all kinds of questions like that that we can answer uh, using sedimentary rocks. So... Our third kind of rock are metamorphic rocks. Uh, now, <laughs> um, in the real world, metamorphic rocks are the most complicated. They are not going to be at all complicated here. Not at all. Okay. Uh, they're, they're just not. Um, but, you know, but let's just keep in mind that, you know, I say here they're formed from other rock. And so that that's, <laughs> you know. That's pretty dang vague. I mean, how do we form these from other rock? Well, we form them by applying heat and pressure. So you apply heat and pressure to the rock, and that causes the rock to change. Um, I liken the process of metamorphism to cooking, right? You take something that is, you know, I don't know, not edible, like bread dough, right? And you, you know, you take that bread dough and you stick it in the oven for however long you do that. I don't know. I don't make bread. And, but it comes out as bread. There's something that is totally different than what went in, right? We applied heat through time to turn one thing into another thing. Um, you know, my mom has a pressure cooker, right? She can put, you know, uh, I don't know, a, a roast in there with some vegetables and we can have, you know, uh, you know, pork roast or whatever, you know, in, you know, I don't know, not very much time, right? So you apply pressure. <laughs> okay, so so here, though, we're going to apply the heat and pressure over very long times. Uh, and we're going to get the rock to change. You know, those chemical elements are going to arrange themselves into new minerals, different minerals. We're going to do all kinds of things. Here's the trick with metamorphic rocks, though. You can't melt the rock, right? If you apply so much heat that you melt the rock, you just made magma. Now it's going to cool into an igneous rock, right? So, so the trick with metamorphism is you have to keep it solid. So this is really weird, high pressure, high temperature, 
um, you know, long time interval, uh, solid state chemistry. Uh, that's not the kind of chemistry that most people do. Uh, and it's really, it gets, it gets really, really complicated very, very fast. Uh, we are not going to address any of that. I honestly, guys, I don't know that stuff. It's, it's really complicated stuff. Uh, I took metamorphic metrology. I was happy to get out of it because it, it is, it is, it is very complicated. So, uh, but let's, so, but let's just take a look. Let's just, you know, scratch the surface here a little bit, right? So, so there's fundamentally two different kinds of metamorphic rock, foliated and non-foliated. Okay. Foliated, have a layered kind of a texture to them, right? Because what's happening is uh, mineral grains are being forced into alignment uh, due to that uh, due to that um, that that pressure that's being applied. And everyone's kind of favorite example of this is the rock Nice, uh, uh, spelled G N E I S S. And you can see you can see this. This isn't the best picture of a Nice in the world. I, I hope there's a better one later on. But but you can see this. This kind of alternating dark and light banding in the rock. That is what we call Nisic banding. You can see here that the banding has been deformed, but that's what we call Nisic banding, and that's what we mean by foliation. On the other hand, when you <clears throat> sorry guys, I need another sip of coffee. My throat's being weird. There we go. Okay, on the other hand, when you look at this marble, um, you don't see any alignment of mineral grains, right? I mean, you know, it just looks like crystalline rock and if i even look at it close up it looks like crystalline rock now <laughs> um every now and then you will see lines running through marble that's called a skylight that's a whole different thing it's it's not foliation um so yeah so a lot of this has to do with what rock you start with a lot of times nices come from granites right and so um and so you know you take a granite and I apply heat and pressure to it. I got a bunch of chemicals in that rock. They can arrange themselves into all kinds of different minerals. And then they can start to, to align themselves. And they can start to kind of separate themselves into larger, lighter and darker layers. Uh, and so you get a whole lot going on there in that nice. Marble, you start with limestone. C-A-C-O-3. Three chemicals. Calcium, carbon, and oxygen. That's it, right? And so you apply heat and pressure to it, eh, it's going to recrystallize. It's going to make bigger crystals, but that's about it. That really is about it, okay? So so uh, now, one interesting thing about marble, um, you know, it comes from limestone. Limestone frequently has fossils in it. Um, if it's a very, very high-grade marble that's had a lot of heat and pressure applied to it, those fossils are gone, okay? But if it's a very low-grade marble, you might still have fossils in it. Uh, and I, for, you know, a, and I, I've seen this in several different places. Um, there is a, a very low grade marble that is very popular um, stone that's used a lot in building and in particular a lot in malls. Uh, and that, I don't remember the name of the mall, you have to bear with me, but that mall over in Tampa, the one near the airport, the big one that everyone goes to over there. If you look at the flooring tiles and some of the wall tiles in that mall, you can see fossils in them. Uh, you can absolutely see fossils in them. Uh, it's a very, very low-grade marble. And I will look through my pictures because I'm sure I have pictures of this. It's a very, very low-grade marble uh, that has fossils in it, oddly enough. So, so yeah. So, um, so nice is a foliated metamorphic rock. Marble is a non-foliated metamorphic rock. Um, non-foliated metamorphic rocks, um, you know, uh, there's a few of them. Uh, for example, quartzite. So if I take a, a quartz sandstone and I apply heat and pressure to it, uh, you'll make a rock called a quartzite. Now, telling a quartzite from a sandstone can be a little bit tricky uh, because they're both made of, you know, uh, you know, sand grains. But here's the thing. Now, normally I would turn around and draw this on the board. I don't have a board. So I did a quick little drawing um, on a piece of paper and took a picture. So ignore my apparent lack of ability to draw a circle and make both ends meet. That's just weird. But anyway, if you look at a sandstone, through not even a microscope, just a tin powered hand lens, if you look at a sandstone, what you're going to see 
are little grains of sand that are usually some degree of rounded. There's going to be something in between them cementing each other. Maybe a couple of them are touching, uh, but it's going to look like this. Uh, and, you know, if you look at a quartzite, though, it looks like this. Because what happens is when I apply pressure, it shoves the sand grains together. And then wherever they're touching, you'll get just a little bit of melting. And it's called pressure solution. You'll get a little bit of melting. And what they will do is they will squeeze together like this. Now, this isn't an either or thing, right? I mean, if, you know, if there, this would be a lot of heat and pressure applied. If there was maybe only a little bit of heat and pressure applied, you might have something in between this and this. You know, so there, there's, you know, sometimes there's some judgment here about, you know, okay, you know, how much pressure solution do I need before I call it a quartzite and not a sandstone? And everyone kind of understands that, but it does require a bit of judgment. But, you know, a good sandstone will look like this. Once again, pretend I'm drawing, you know, making my sand grains meet. Uh, a quartzite will look like that. Uh, and so, so yeah. So uh, the other thing is, you know, pay attention to what's around you. Right. If I'm in an area with a whole bunch of other sedimentary rock, that's going to be a sandstone. If I'm in an ancient mountain range, I expect to see metamorphic rock. That's going to be a quartzite. So, you know, context is kind of everything. Um, if I apply um, even more heat and pressure to bituminous coal, which is a sedimentary rock, I will make anthracite coal, which is a metamorphic rock. Uh, this is the, the quote-unquote good stuff. We really still shouldn't be burning it. But um, but you can get a lot of energy out of this if you burn it. Uh, also release a lot of toxins. But you'll get a lot of energy out of it. Coal comes in grades, guys. It begins as um, peat, which is basically organic rich soil. You can go to hardware stores and buy bags of peat, right? Um if I apply heat and pressure to that, um, I make a rock called lignite. It's a very, very low-grade coal. It's one step up from dirt. Uh, you can, well, you can burn peat to make power. Actually, they do it in Ireland a lot. Um, you can burn lignite to make power, too, but you have to put your lignite-fired power plant at your lignite mine. Uh, you cannot ship it. If you ship it, it's not worth it anymore. Um, bituminous coal, a little bit better, a little more heat and pressure. You can ship that a little ways. Anthracite coal, you can ship across, around the world, and you still get more energy out of it than you, than you put into it. So it is the quote-unquote good stuff, uh, but we have no business burning it anyway because it releases a lot of nastiness into the air. So, um, um, and then uh, metaconglomerate. So this is gonna, this rock is actually going to be the subject of one of our virtual field trips. There's a site not too far from here that has some metaconglomerate in it. I'm going to head over there uh, in a few days and do a video from over there. But if I take a conglomerate and I apply heat and pressure to it, I make a meta conglomerate, right? So I've got these pebble-sized particles, but you can see this is a great metaconglomerate. It really is. Um, you can see how the pebble-sized particles have been flattened uh, by the pressure. Now, in this particular case, we know that the pressure was coming from the lower, lower right and the upper left, right? It was getting squeezed this way, and the pebbles are elongated this way. Um, this is a this is a great meta conglomerate. Um, most of them look a little more like this on the right. Um, which, you know, you can see a little bit of flattening here. You can kind of, if you use your imagination, you can see a little bit of flattening here. But you can see how the rocks have been really well integrated into the matrix. Uh, and then the other thing you look for that I honestly don't see in this rock, and I looked for it before I started this lecture, so I really don't see it, is cracks. In metaconglomerates, the cracks will go across the pebbles. Um, in normal conglomerates, the cracks go around the pebbles. And I know for a fact there is a metaconglomerate at this one site that I'm going to take you to um, that's cracked. And we'll see that. So hold on for that. But yeah, so metaconglomerate, another non-foliated metamorphic rock. Um, the foliated metamorphic rocks, the rocks that have this kind of layering in them, uh, are kind of useful um, in that they can tell you how much heat and pressure were applied to the rock. Uh, you can determine metamorphic grade uh, from a foliated metamorphic rock. And the basic idea here is the better the foliation, um, 
the uh, the higher the metamorphic grade. So so the more distinctive the foliation is, the more heat and pressure were applied to the rock. And so you know if you know just a wee bit about metamorphic rocks, you can talk about how you know look yeah um there was a lot of heat and pressure applied here, or maybe there wasn't any heat and pressure or very little heat and pressure applied. Very little looks like this. This is a slate. Slate is a rock that gets very frequently confused with shale uh, because they, they both can look a very lot of light. Uh, in shale, the layering that you're seeing is bedding layers in, in sedimentary rock. In slate, the layering that you're seeing um, is, uh, is foliation. Uh, what's happening here is we're growing the mineral mica. Uh, remember from our mineral lecture, mica is that mineral that, that breaks very, very thin. Remember that guy, that geologist I showed you the video of, he had that big sheet of mica. And, you know, you can break that very, very thin. Well, this mineral, is, this rock rather, is starting to grow mica. And so what that means is it will break very, very flat along this one this one plane uh, we don't really talk about cleavage in rocks that's a mineral property but this rock breaks so this rock breaks so flat that we sometimes do talk about slaty cleavage um where yeah the rock does break awfully flat which makes it pretty useful there's what it looks like in the field uh there's some there's some slate uh, and you can kind of see it uh, breaking flat. It, it does make it very useful though, because it makes you know it's very commonly used as a uh, as a as an ornamental tile. Um, I would not put it in my kitchen or my bathroom where there's likely to be water on the floor because that will get very very slippery. Uh, just a couple years ago, I built a little walkway for my mom in her garden, uh, and I, I went and got some sandstone, right, because that can get wet and still, you know, have some traction to it. This stuff, if it gets wet, it's going to get slippery pretty dang quickly. Um, also, it is a roofing tile in a lot of places. Uh, now, you know, one one stupid geologist trick I'm going to show you, and it doesn't need to look fancy, by the way. It can look like that. Uh, but one um, geologist trick I'm going to show you in our field trips is if you're in an area and you want to know what kind of rock is around there, look at what they're using in their buildings, right? Especially, you know, not the really, really fancy ones where they're going to import tile from Italy or something like that. Look at the normal buildings, right? See what materials they're using because odds are they're using local materials, right? You don't see a whole lot of slate roofs in Florida, right? It's not worth it to haul slate from wherever the nearest slate is to make a roof, right? We don't do that there. We use, you know, those tiles or whatever right um so but you know but if you get up into appalachia or you know up into some mountains or something like that you'll see a lot of slate used as building material because it's there and it's inexpensive it's you know so you can you know so so you know look at the buildings not not the big fancy ones look at the normal buildings see what they're using for building material odds are there's some of that rock around there um if um if you apply a little more heat and pressure, you make a rock called a phyllite. It's also very low grade. Slate's very low grade metamorphic rock, right? Just a wee bit of heat and pressure. Phyllite's the same way. Um, telling a slate from a phyllite can be um, tricky. Um, but with phyllite, you get the shine on the surface. See how that surface is kind of shiny? Those mica grains are getting bigger. Uh, they're getting a lot bigger. And so now the surface kind of becomes shiny, uh, and yeah, it's a fill A little bit higher grade than a slate, but still kind of a low-grade metamorphic rock. Um, intermediate to high, we have a rock called a schist. Now, the mica grains are big. Uh, now you can peel them with your fingernail. Uh, this is photographed from the side, so you can see this layering in the rock. That's the foliation. Um, Big mica grains, you start growing uh, secondary minerals now. You start growing things like garnets uh, or maybe, uh, I don't know, you, you just, just all kinds of secondary minerals start start filling in now. Uh, and yeah, intermediate to high grade. There are some schists that are very high grade. Uh, graphite is another mineral that frequently starts to grow um, in these schists. And so, uh, you know, intermediate to high grade metamorphic rock. Um and then uh, here we are at the Grand Canyon. Uh, sorry, I didn't know this slide was coming. <laughs> so here we're at the Grand Canyon. I mentioned this before. Um, the upper part of the Grand Canyon is all sedimentary, but down here at the bottom is a schist called the Vishnu Schist. 
uh, and it was eroded. It's very old. It was eroded, and then, you know, the first um, of the sedimentary rocks was deposited on top of that, and when we talk about uh, geologic time, we'll talk about that erosion and the deposition of rock on top of it, but Vishnu Shifts down here at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and then high-grade metamorphic rocks are gneisses. Um, these rocks are on the bare, ragged edge of melting, but once again, you can't melt it. If you melt it, that's not a, that's not a uh, metamorphic rock anymore, right? That's an igneous rock. I just made magma. Now I'm back to composition and texture, cooling speed, and things like that. So, so um, generally, you start with a granite. And then you end up uh, applying heat and pressure to it, and you make a nice. You can see that the the nice, haha, nice rock. Yeah, okay. So we made the joke. Um, but you can see the banding here. This is called nisic banding, uh, running back and forth across this rock. And the handy thing about it is, it tells you what direction the pressure was. Right? If the banding's running this way, the pressure is running this way. And so, uh, so you know, it tells you a little bit about tectonics. Any foliation tells you about tectonics, right? The pressure was perpendicular to the direction of the uh, of the of the foliation. Um, here's one in the field. I don't know where. I just got this picture off the internet, so bear with me. But this is really cool because you can see I've got a nice right here, but literally sitting right next to it is a granite. And so you know the pressure that turned this rock into a nice turned this into magma. And it recooled as a granite. And the difference was probably water. Um, water has a profound effect on rock in a lot of ways. One thing water does, if there's any of it in the crystal or uh, the crystal matrix, it will uh, it'll lower the melting temperature. And so and so you know, nice is under the best of circumstances. Uh, you know, on the bare, ragged edge of melting. In fact, we use these words as adjectives. We talk about nisic granites and granitic gneisses. Gneisses and granites kind of go together. Uh, and you can see here what happened was there was enough pressure, turned this into a gneiss, but melted that because it had more water in it, and so turned it into magma, and that magma cooled into granite. This happens a lot. Uh, with nices in the field and then, let me see. I think I got one more picture. Yeah, here's a nice Irish gentleman standing on some uh, on some nice there. So yeah, so um, okay. So remember how I said, you know, when we look at the Appalachian Mountains, I wish I had a slide for this, but I don't, but that's okay. Um, I said this, uh, I think I said it in class a few times. I know I've said it in my lectures a few times. I said, look, when we look at the Appalachian Mountains today, uh, you know, I'll go back to this picture. It's a better picture. When we look at the Appalachian Mountains today, we're looking at the ground down nubs of a formerly much taller mountain range. Um, and, and now we're in a position to know a little bit more about that. When we look at the rocks on the surface today, so if you're hiking the Appalachian Trail or you are driving on the Blue Ridge Parkway or something like that and you're looking at the rocks, they're all nicest. They're all nices and high, high, high grade schists. Uh, uh, that's just, they're all, you know, intermediate to high grade metamorphic rocks, right? There's no sedimentary rock on top of it. All that has been eroded away. If you go into the Himalayas, there's sedimentary rock in the Himalayas still. We're, you know, uh, but you go to the Appalachians and no, you're looking at the roots of that mountain range. You're looking at the, the high grade metamorphics that would normally be buried underneath you know thousands of feet of of rock and so like i say when we look at the appalachians that's the interior of the mountain that's the ground down roots of that mountain all righty uh so there's um there's uh metamorphic rocks so uh now that we know a little bit more about rock um the next two lectures are going to be death and destruction Volcanoes and earthquakes, one on volcanoes, one on earthquakes. I don't know if they're going to be in that order. It might be volcanoes and earthquakes or earthquakes and volcanoes. Don't know. Uh, and then after that will be geologic time. So I've got three more lectures in geology to go. My apologies. I think I sent out an email the other day uh, where I said three and there were four. But now there's three. Uh, and so, yeah, I will get on scheduling the test. I know you're all worried about that. I'll be on that. Don't worry. I'm not going to spring it on you. Um and check your email because um, we now have a paper option. Write a paper rather than answer the book question. So check your email for details about that. Uh, and now that we know a bit more about rocks, I'm going to go out into the field around here uh, and show you guys some rocks and show you guys some things. 
So, uh, so I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you are too. Um, I will probably get to that next week. Uh, I want to go ahead and get those three more lectures done from geology. Um, and yeah, I know I also said that I would um, start grading papers after I got the lectures done. I see you got, not papers, well yeah, start grading labs and stuff after I got the lectures done. I see y'all are doing really good about getting those done. So I'm probably going to go ahead and start grading those uh, now rather than waiting uh, just cuz so anyway if there's anything I can do uh, shoot me an email uh, other than that y'all take care wash your hands don't touch your face avoid people and uh, I'll see you all for the uh, first of uh, first of our death and destruction lectures which will either be volcanoes or earthquakes not sure which one we'll find out when I do it okay take care y'all bye bye Hey guys, I was out hiking and I realized I forgot to show you guys the lab exercises for uh, sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. So um, I'll unlock them when I upload the video. So here's the uh, here's the lab for sedimentary and if I scroll on down metamorphic rocks and then you're going to use the same rock spreadsheet that you use for igneous only if you look down here the bottom left you can see the tabs igneous sedimentary and metamorphic so obviously when you're identifying sedimentary rocks look on the sedimentary tab so um, if you see a grain size mentioned uh, it'll be clastic and so use the grain size that I mentioned to figure out what the rock is so for example rock looks like it was made from other rock made from rounded pebble sized pieces rounded pebble sized pieces you find over here and that gives you a, um, a name for the rock uh, here's angular pebble sized pieces that gives you the name of a rock here's one that is this you know flower sized etc so so uh, so I explicitly mentioned the size of the particle use that to identify the classic sedimentary rock for the chemicals I give you a description uh, and you can match that description to uh, to this section of the chart over here that has descriptions of the chemical sedimentary rock. So it shouldn't be that big a deal. Uh, same thing with the metamorphics. If we scroll down, 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 there's the metamorphics. Switch your tab over here to metamorphic. And so we've got the foliated ones over here, the non-foliated ones over here. Once again, just use the description uh, to, you know, to, uh, to name the rock. And so uh, shouldn't be too big a deal. And once you get this done, uh, stick it in the Dropbox. Um, I've had a couple people email me that they're they're having trouble uh, typing in uh, here. That's because you need to enable editing up here. Now, in order to do that, you have to actually download the file. When you get, you know, when you hit download on the file, it says, "Do you want to open it or do you want to download it?" You have to actually download it. See, now I just opened this one, so when I hit enable editing. Oh, it did it. Okay, fine. So I uh, didn't expect that. But anyway, um, over here, let's see if I enable editing. Will it let me do it? No, it will not. Yeah, this one I apparently actually downloaded. This one I did not. I just said, yeah, open it from the Internet. And that, that won't let you edit it, although you don't really need to edit this spreadsheet. So anyway, if you're having trouble um, putting your answers in, uh, come up here and hit enable editing. And if it doesn't let you enable editing, that means that um, you need to actually download it. The other thing is this rock chart, you have to actually download it too, or at least um, open it. Don't, my point being here, sorry, take a breath. <sighs> my point here being don't open this in my courses. It's formatted all messed up. So you need to actually download it. Okay, guys, uh, so by the time you're hearing this, I'll have this stuff unlocked in my courses, and it'll be ready for you to do. Okay, you all take care. Bye-bye.